I am really happy to introduce Emma Mercier. Um, she is, as our final speaker for the Jacobs CRLT series this year, um, and certainly it's last but not least. Um, I guess Emma and I have walked in many of the same circles in the learning sciences because we both do work on collaborative learning and have organized a couple of workshops together, mm -hmm. so I'm really delighted that you're here. Emma is an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and she was able to compare Illinois roads with Indiana roads on her trip here <laughs> yesterday. Um, I will not say anything about her conclusions. Um, her work focuses on collaborative learning and digital learning environments. Her research interests are in the social aspects of learning and how technology can be used to support learning and teaching in classrooms. She asks questions about how learning occurs through social interaction and with technology. Um, I think another thing we have in common is working across lots of different populations and grade levels. Um, from elementary to higher education, exploring aspects of collaborative learning and classroom technologies. And you've been out long enough, I'm not going to talk about your PhD stuff. No, it's long anymore. Um, Although so I did just get it published last year, which uh, was kind of impressively long time to get PhD work out. Well, Eight years, I think. Uh, my advisor gave a talk at uh, Educational Testing Service when I was at Rutgers. It was probably after I'd been there like 12 years. And I realized I just had to stop introducing myself as his student. So, um, anyway, Emma is going to talk about supporting teachers in computer-supported collaborative learning classrooms. And without me taking more time from your talk, um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Great. Thank you. And thank you guys for having me here today. Uh, this is really exciting to talk about this work. Um, I haven't actually talked about this before. Um, and so you're basically getting... Um, one and a half parts of an AERA talk and half of an ICLS talk um, that I've kind of put together for this. Um, and I'm really, um, so this is really new work. Um, and so please, um, generally keep questions at the end, but if I've missed, if, you, if there's some context that's missing, um, please just put up your hand and be like, hang on, we can't follow you right now. You've forgotten something really important. Because this is a segment of a much larger project. Um, and something I've got really interested in in the last few years um, is this question of what do teachers do during collaborative learning in classrooms? Um, so to give you a little bit of background um, or agenda for today's talk, um, I'm going to talk about the project background so you know how to situate this work, um, and then talk about uh, data on what's going on in the typical classrooms that we're working in. Um, I'm working with uh, undergraduate students in engineering, um, and so we're looking at uh, teaching assistants rather than teachers, uh, which um, I think some things are um, transferable to working with teachers and some of them less so. Um, so we're, I'll talk about some work that we did in a TA training seminar. Um, and then the second part is work that we're doing around data analytics and TA uh, dashboards. Um, and then move on to talk about conclusions and next steps, because this really is work in progress. Um, so to, a little bit of project background on this. Uh, these are two um, NSF multi-year design-based implementation research projects. Uh, so the first project was funded in 2014 as an exploratory grant. Um, and then in 2016, we got a DIP grant to follow on. Uh, they overlap by a year, so the last year was a little bit crazy. Um, and so uh, we are um, trying to make sense of how these two things, how, how uh, to create and support collaborative learning in large engineering classes. Um, we're working uh, what I thought was going to be with one class uh, that enrolls about a thousand students a year. Um, when I started working with the faculty, I realized that there's this three course sequence um, that in 2012 they actually uh, started this process of pedagogic reform across the three courses, um, which is an incredible opportunity to actually get to do research and design research uh, with faculty who are already committed to changing their teaching. Um, but it meant that instead of just hanging out with one set of students and faculty and TAs, we ended up uh, working across the three classes. And I've actually done the first project ended up being with the first of the classes, and the current project is with the last of the classes. Um, these are huge classes, and I have to sit on my hands a lot of the time and not collect data, because um, there's so many opportunities to collect data, but just not enough hours in life to analyze all the video we could possibly gather. Um, it is a massive learning experience for me. Um, and I do have way too much data at this point. Um, so the goals of the, pro the first project was really to look at, um, can we create software to help students create joint representations when they're working in collaborative groups? Uh, they were handing out bits of paper for students and saying, work in a group. 
Um, these are introductory engineering courses that are creating uh, free body diagrams uh, to solve their problems. Um, and they weren't, they didn't have any tools to uh, jointly share these things with you know, the one piece of paper in front of a student is hard uh, to share with a group. So that's where we started. Um, because I tend to, to lean, to lend towards these sort of um, implementation based projects where we're working closely with the faculty, uh, the primary focus very quickly got adapted to be include uh, task design, TA training, faculty consultation. We actually worked with the faculty to redesign the classroom at one point. Um, so we've kind of been attacking this from all sorts of different directions. Well, these are two projects. We talk about them as one because it kind of bleeds into each other. Um, so to give you a little bit of uh, sense of where, we're, what, where this uh, research today is coming from, uh, the first year of the project, uh, we actually got funded in the middle of August, um, and the course we were working with was starting to implement collaborative learning the last week of August. Um, so we, this is a way to annoy all your purchasing people where you turn around and say, okay, I need to buy a whole lot of cameras really fast because we're going to be in the classroom in the second week of the semester collecting data about what's going on to get baseline data of what was going on in the classroom. Uh, when I do uh, technology design, the first thing I really want to do is find out what are the problems that students are having. We wrote the grant assuming that we wanted to create uh, tools to create joint representations, um, but we really wanted to see what else was going on. Uh, what did they really need? Um, and so that first year was also this lot, a lot of relationship development with the TAs and faculty um, across these three courses. Um, in year two, uh, we did uh, we we created the software that we used on individual tablets, um, large multi-touch tables, and synchronized tablets, where everyone in the group had the um, their, every tablet in a group was synchronized. So if I draw my tablet, the other people in my group can see what I'm drawing. Um, we uh, got looped into doing some TA training sessions, which is what I'll talk about today. Um, and then we also actually worked um, with the faculty and TAs, particularly between the summers of year two and three, on task design and how to actually go about creating authentic uh, collaborative tasks for the students. Year three, uh, we compared uh, the multi-touch tables with synchronized tablets. At this point, we dropped the individual tablets, um, much to no one's surprise. Uh, working on an individual tablet is hard for collaborative work. Um, and then uh, this is the overlapping year between the two grants, so we actually did some log file analysis and simple video coding of the tablet data that we collected in year three for the first project. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Uh, this was really our question of, can we do this? Um, we had no idea whether it was going to be possible. Um, year four, uh, we just finished collecting data on uh, just students just using synchronized tablets for the log file analysis. Multi-touch tables are way too complicated uh, to work out who's doing what. Uh, so for the second project, we are just looking at tablet data. Um, we're doing much more complex video coding at the moment on that data. Um, and we started off looking at a basic TA dashboard um, where we will show the task location and activity every minute, which I'll talk about a little bit towards the end. Um, and then finally, just so you know where we're going with this, next spring we will hopefully be doing uh, prompts for the TAs on what's going on in the classroom, um, assuming this all works out. Okay, so... To give you a look, I know um, some of you know a lot about collaborative learning. Uh, when I'm talking about collaborative learning, I'm talking about tasks that require students to co-construct knowledge um, and to engage in authentic problem-solving activities. Uh, not merely um, an individual task that you're asking students to um, solve in a group, um, or a task that can be divided up among group members and come back and put together, which is more sort of a jigsaw or cooperative learning uh, type activity. Um, we draw on that literature somewhat, uh, but this is specifically what we're talking about in this project. Um, why are we doing collaborative learning? Um, you know, one of the primary reasons is, of course, that it has been shown to increase learning and transfer of content to new material. Uh, but for these courses, uh, the, two, the two primary reasons are really to increase persistence of minorities and minority students and females in STEM disciplines. Three, these three required courses are required of all but the um, computer engineering uh, program. Um, everyone else requires it. And so this is an, these are gatekeeping courses, kids who can't... Um, don't, who don't do well in these classes or who fi find them alienating. And with 650 people in your class, there's lots of potential for it to be alienated. Um, just they drop out of, of engineering programs. And so um, one of the reasons the college started this program of pedagogic reform was to start um, improving students' attachment to these classes. Um, so, so this is a, a priority of the faculty that we're working with. Um, and then the need to prepare students to engage in collaborative problem solving when they graduate. Um, Students can be incredibly successful in engineering um, by solving equations, by you know, 
drill and practice, get it right, and they need to do a lot of that. Um, but they're not necessarily very good at talking about the problems or solving novel problems. Um, so these are the things of uh, ABET, the accrediting agency requires this in engineering programs, um, but it's also something you really want them to be able to do when, they're, when they graduate, to be able to talk about what, they can, what they're doing um, and talk to each other about it. Okay, um, there are lots and lots of frameworks out there about what makes collaborative learning successful, and I go back and forth between computer-supported collaborative learning and collaborative learning. Um, so this is our framework around CSCL, um, where we talk about so the overlapping spaces of tasks, technology, teams, and teachers, and how that takes place in a classroom context. Um, there's lots of pieces of this. CSCL tends to look at technology and teams. Uh, things like TPAC um, look at teachers and technology. Um, tasks don't always get into our conversation in collaborative learning. Cooperative learning has spent a lot more time focused on that. Um, and so as I approach this, I think about how all of these pieces fit together. <coughs> The role of teachers in collaborative learning, however, is something that we've spent a lot less time pay paying attention to. It's always nice when someone like Noreen Webbs writes a paper in 2009 saying that we haven't, we haven't got a lot of research on this topic. Um, to highlight it, there is, um, there's been some research over the years, um, and I think one of the things that we've been able to do as technology has improved is actually be able to capture everything that's going on in a classroom. Um, and this leads, instead of saying just looking at a small group, actually leading us to understand the sort of between group interactions that go on and the whole class interactions and how that may influence uh, the learning experiences that students are having. So we know some, from some work in the early 2000s in elementary schools uh, that high levels of monitoring are associated with um, better group outcomes. Um, and, we know, and there's some flaws in this paper about better uh, process-focused intervention, so focusing on the collaborative process um, leads to better outcomes than content-focused intervention, so just helping students work on the, on the content that they're working on. Um, earlier work by Webb also points out that the wrong type of intervention can really disrupt the collaborative process, um, and I have many hours of video that show this happening, um, <laughs> including some of my self-teaching, which is the worst to ever watch, where you go up and interrupt a group who are doing really well, and you throw them off task, and you have uh, messed them up. Um, and so you know, one, of the things that we really, one of the things we really are focusing on is, how, is can you help people identify good collaboration and leave them alone, mm -hmm. as well as can you identify groups that are struggling um, and intervene as necessary. Um, I will say there is a large amount of research in cooperative learning around uh, what teachers should do to prepare um, for classroom implementation. There's a whole lot more work in the field of cooperative learning around uh, classrooms and aimed at teachers. Um, but even in that, there is less about how to make sense of what's going on in a group. Um, how does a teacher decide when and wh when to intervene and with what type of intervention? Um, and so this is really something that we're looking at. Okay. So what happens in a typical collaborative learning session? As I said, we got uh, really lucky in terms of being able to do data collection as soon as uh, this project was funded, when they were, began implementing collaborative learning in these classrooms. They, so there's three classes in the sequence, and this is the first class. So they had implemented collaborative learning in the second two classes first. And so half of the teaching assistants had been working in the later classes, half of them were brand new to the idea of collaborative learning. This is, we did this in the fall, so there are 650 students uh, registered in the class in the fall. Discussion sections of 45. Um, we ended up in five of the discussion sections. There's about 15 discussion sections happening every week. Um, so these are 50 minutes, 45 students in a class. And this is a photograph from that classroom. Um, and this is why we redesigned the classroom, uh, because um, slanted armchair tables are make it really difficult to have, a, have an even any joint space. There's not a flat surface um, that they can actually all um, look at. Um, we had four video cameras in the classroom pointing at four different groups. Um, over the course of this class um, actually runs for about 12 weeks of the semester. Um, and the, so we were just like, okay, just do what you, you know, do what you plan to do and you know we'll, we'll sort of get to know you guys over the semester. We did, we actually got to know the faculty and TAs. We attended the TA meetings every week for this um, and had some influence on what was happening. So every, initially every week they were moving, they were randomly assigning students to a different group every week. Uh, with a group, with a class of 45, you actually do end up in a different group quite often and with different people. Um, and you're coming from a lecture of 650. Um, so the chance of you actually knowing anybody in the class is really low. Um, and this, they had gone out and talked to other departments and other colleges on, on the campus who were doing this, and this is what they'd been advised to do. Um, you don't want a student to end up in a bad group. 
some people suggest we don't want students to get too comfortable. Um, I kind of argue that we do actually want students to get comfortable in these classes, and that's how you learn from other people. Um, so we actually managed to talk them into um, in the five classes that we were data collecting in for weeks seven through ten to leave the group stable. Um, and in the other ten classes, they switched them up every week. And some of the TAs were in both classes, so they actually got to um, give us feedback. And after this intervention, uh, across all three classes, they leave the group stable for the entire semester. Um, and so there is some um, ability for the students. I think one of the classes they switched them up half eight weeks in, but they, they actually do get to know each other. We had when well, we collected this data for four weeks, and we did actually have students at the end of the four weeks who didn't know the names of the other people in their group. Um, we were surprised. One of my favorite TAs who did a really nice job in the classroom came in one week to teach a different section and didn't introduce himself to anybody. Um, some of the teachers, some of the students thought he was one of the professors that teaches the lecture classes, which I was like, no, uh, there's about 40 years in difference in age and entirely different accents. Um, so it was one of those like, okay, you guys perhaps don't pay a lot of attention in your lecture. Um, but he didn't, even, he didn't even come in and say, hey, I'm, I'm taking over today. Um, this is who I am. Um, so th there's just you know, some fundamental pieces missing um, in what, you know, what is the role of a teacher and what is the role of students in these classes other than um, you know, traditionally what was happening, and you can see there's, there's actually blackboards on three sides of this room. In a traditional discussion section, uh, the TA comes in and solves the equations for that week on the blackboard with everybody copying down what's going on. Um, so that's what the TAs are used to. Our teaching assistants in, at this stage are graduate students in engineering. They were, to a large extent, all highly successful undergraduates. Um, in traditional programs, so sometimes they just don't understand. Like, why can't you know? Why can't all these kids just get it? Like, I got it. Mm -hmm. um, I was taught with somebody standing at the blackboard. Um, why are we? Why are we making these changes? Uh, was one of the difficulties that we ran into. So to look at a little bit of data from this, uh, this is from those uh, four weeks where we kept the group stable um, across the five classes. We collected data from twenty groups. We got seven groups that remained stable. Uh, we did perhaps. Act incorrectly collect data on a Friday morning, um, which doesn't lead to stable attendance. Um, probably not surprising. Um, and so this is where we're looking at the quality of group interaction. Um, and so I haven't gone into a lot of the details here, but we know the quality of um, whether people are um, building on each other's ideas is really important for successful collaborative group work. Um, we code it for um, whether statements uh, built on what, what the previous person said or not. Uh, so the first thing we coded for was independent statements. This is a statement that has nothing to do with what came before. Um, and you need a certain amount of this in conversation. Somebody needs to bring up a new topic. Um, sometimes in group tasks, you're quietly working on a piece. Everyone's solving a problem. And, you know, okay, what's, you know, how, do, what, how do we address question two? You need a certain amount of this. And so we have a, between about 10 and 20% each week is independent. Um, and this is not bad. Quasi interactive statements, and this is the one that runs between 80 and 90% of our data, is statements that respond to but do not build on what the previous person said. Mm -hmm. um, so this is acknowledging that you spoke. Yeah, I agree. Um, saying something that's related to what you just said but doesn't build on it. So we're talking about the same topic. We're both talking about question two, uh, but we're not actually really talking to each other about it. Um, and then the third thing that we looked at is these interactive statements. And we actually coded these for... Uh, two different types of interaction. We code it for elaboration. So do I take what you said and build on it? Or negotiation, do I take what you said and try to um, negotiate whether or not I agree with you? Um, I collapse these into one because otherwise they don't show up on my graph. Um, so we started at about 2%. We get to about 7% across the four weeks. Um, and this is not, across the seven groups, this is not a uniform. Well, it does actually go up in this graph. It does not go up for every group. It's all over the place, really. Um, I... Uh, error bars kind of disappear when I make the dots big enough for you to see. Um, so we're not really seeing the students get very much better, and they're not doing the type of interaction that we expect to see if they're going to have the benefit of collaborative learning. There's a whole lot of reasons for this. As I said, you know, we worked with task design, we worked with classroom design, we worked on a whole lot of features of this. But one of the um, sort of telling features is what were the TAs doing? Uh, so from these seven groups, we have 101 interactions. Uh, about half of them are when the TA just walks up to the group. About half of them are when the group call the TA over. 99 of these were about the content. Um, one of them, in one instance, they talked about the content and the group process, and in one instance, they talked about the group process. So the students aren't getting any input to make their collaboration better. Um, so it's not really surprising that we don't see a whole lot of improvement over time. What was going on with these TAs? Um, you know, a large part, they don't understand the purpose of collaborative learning. Um, and 
the students weren't being assessed on what they learned in this. Um, so, you know, there's a whole lot of new equations in these classes. They're learning a lot of content um, that you, that, and we know this. Drill and practice works when you're trying to make sense of this kind of stuff, when you're trying to get good at applying formula over and over again to the same type of problems. So they didn't always understand why they were doing collaborative learning. Um, they didn't know what good or bad collaborative interactions look like. Um, so even, even if they were going over and observing the groups, which we didn't see very often, um, a lot of the time they were just walking in and saying, hey, how are you guys doing? Um, they didn't know what to look for. Um, as I said, they're graduate students in engineering. They haven't necessarily done a lot of collaboration themselves. Um, and they, haven't, they certainly haven't received any um, training on, how, on what to look for in groups. Uh, they don't know when to intervene, um, and they don't know how to prompt good collaborative interactions. Um, they don't even know what to, like, sometimes they would say, like, you know, we know this group is really struggling, but other than, like, ask your teammates, they don't really know what else to say. Um, which, you know, I'm not sure at times we're like, well, I don't really know what else, because we have to go back and teach you all the other, like, all the stuff about what's going on in the group, um, so that you can um, try and diagnose what's going on, rather than just say, talk to your teammates. So the first, the second semester that we were working with them, they actually started this uh, TA seminar that one of the postdocs was teaching, um, and then we got brought in to actually um, teach the seminar. It was actually, it was funded by a separate NSF project. Um, so over two semesters um, of the second year of my work with them, uh, there was this uh, hour, one, one hour a week uh, special topics in the field. Um, t required by all teaching assistants, and by this point we had redesigned the classroom, and so instead of having 45 students in the classroom, they had 32 students in the classroom, um, which you know, makes it a whole lot easier to actually manage um, eight groups instead of 11 or 12 groups. Um, but this meant for, for a cost reason, instead of having graduate student TAs, two graduate student TAs in every class, they had one graduate student and one undergraduate student, one undergraduate course assistant, who's someone who had taken the class in the past and been successful at it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in, in many ways were people who were actually really interested in teaching, which is why they wanted to do this. They're being paid like $10 an hour or something, and only for the time they're in the classroom. So it's not, you know, they're not making big bucks all out of it, um, and they tend to be really interested in the teaching of the class. Um, so it was required for all teaching assistants uh, because they were on uh, TA ships. Um, not required for uh, course assistance. We had 16 TAs across 15 sections um, in the three, uh, these three required courses who attended, and the CAs sort of came in and out. Um, for the first semester, I taught it, and one of my graduate students uh, attended my seminar, um, and when the TAs would allow him, he attended their classes too, um, and provided sort of direct feedback to them about how they were doing, and feedback to me about you know, whether they are actually trying some of the stuff we talked about. Um, in semester two, it was co-taught by two of my graduate students. I had to go back and teach my education classes. Um, and so um, they, they did, again, a lot more of the sort of actually attending uh, the, the TA sessions, uh, their classes, and um, providing them with feedback. So we did pre and post test surveys. We did teaching observations. I'm not going to go into all the details of it. Um, I was going to talk about course content. But um, well, starting this class was really difficult. We're like, what do people need to know? They've had like two days of the. Um, Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learnings, you know, here's your FERPA issues, here's your, like, basic classroom management kind of stuff, but how do we, what, what would we want, what would you want to teach someone about collaborative learning if they're going to go teach it, uh, particularly when they're going to go teach it tomorrow um, and every week. Um, so we, we thought we used the um, Kendler's Implementing Collaborative Learning in Classrooms framework, um, which is this, um, in part to give them some idea about what to do. Um, the, like a lot of the time they showed up to class without really having prepared anything, uh, which for, you know, I'm sure some of you have come from being teachers and realized that there's a lot of preparation that goes on before you get to the classroom. Uh, for people who've never thought about teaching, they don't think that they have to do that. They, you know, it's astounding to me that people don't realize that their teacher's prepared before they came to class. Um, so this idea that you should plan before you get to class, uh, that when you're in the class you should be monitoring what's going on in the groups, supporting them, and this piece that we've spent a lot of time on is consolidating. So just because you finish the task doesn't mean you can get up and leave. We should actually reflect on what you were doing today. Um, and then afterwards, um, reflecting on how the class went, what, what could you do differently? Um, so just giving them a framework for what to do uh, was a starting place in this class. Uh, we, I'm not going to go into these in detail. We used HESA's uh, collaborative problem solving skills um, framework. Uh, one of the things I like about this, it, I don't think it captures everything we know in the literature. But they are, um, 
they provide descriptions of behavior and what they look like at low, medium, and high. And they're, um, it was designed to be measurable and teachable. And so these are actually, you can actually read the behaviors and maybe see them in groups, um, which made it a sort of very functional uh, framework to use. And then we also use adaptive, the adaptive expertise framework as we got, as I got into like trying to explain um, what, um, why do we do collaborative learning in a, in a class where you're going to be assessed on a multiple, you know, we have 650 students in a class, you're getting a multiple choice exam at the end of this. Um, and there is, this stuff blows my mind when you get into the complexities of the sort of all the variations that students get so they can't possibly cheat on these exams. Um, but efficiency is what you need. Um, you need to get really good at this and you need to get really fast at this. Um, and that's what we're assessing and that's what um, has been, has been um, privileged in these courses over the years. Um, but when you actually go out in the world, you get innovative new problems that you have to deal with. Um, so we use this framework to talk about, you know, the collaborative problem solving um, tasks fit into this space. Um, what Schwartz and I'll call the optimal adaptability corridor, um, where students are actually getting, you know, they do their homeworks, they're doing quizzes, they have like homeworks every week and quizzes every two weeks and midterms and finals and all sorts of, things, of exams that, you know, as a college of education faculty, we, you know, you get one nice final paper and you're done, uh, which is definitely a whole lot easier than this huge amount of assessment. Um, but, you know, you know they're, not, they're learning the content along here. And so in the, in the discussion sections, you're trying to get them to apply it. I mean, you're trying to get them to be innovative. And this was actually a really helpful framework for a lot of our um, CAs. Our findings from our surveys and interviews and discussions with them, um, what, you know, one of the hard things for, the, for them was that there's no simple, simple formula to this. You can't just look at a group and know um, what's going on. Um, you need to sort of develop this um, sort of expert seeing kind of idea. And I'm completely blanking on the theory behind this um, around expert seeing, and if anyone can help me with it. I, I've been trying to come up with it all week and asking everybody. Um, but the, the sort of the mastery and noticing successful and unsuccessful behaviors is something that takes time. Um, and you know, one of the things I would love to do out of this is actually you know, gather a corpus of videos of groups in different phases so that you can actually show them. Um, I have some data that I'm allowed to show to a wider audience. Um, and could use that, but it's all with 10-year-olds. Um, and so sometimes the TAs found that really useful and sometimes they didn't. 10-year-olds um, are somewhat different from undergrads. Um, they talk a whole lot more, if nothing else. Um, they need to learn to implement these interventions in the real world setting. And this is, you know, this is the reality of teaching. And you know, when we design teacher education programs, we do send kids out to test it out in the classroom. Um, and so this back and forth that we were working on was really useful. Um, but the feedback that they were getting from my graduate students was probably the thing they found the most useful when they came into their classroom and they watched them do it. The cost of that is insane. Um, and so um, both to my graduate students' um, research, because uh, they can't spend their whole time in engineering classes teaching them how to teach, um, and just you know, who's going to pay for it. So what happened next? Uh, we continue to dis discuss these ideas. I'm not sure a seminar is the right way to go about it. Um, one of the things that in the second seminar, my grad students did a good job of is having them work in teams and take their assignments for that week and actually go like, okay, when, what sort of collaboration, what sort of interaction do you expect at different phases in these tasks? Um, or like, can we work that into their weekly TA session? There's so many logistics in this class that TA sessions kind of get overwhelmed with that. Um, as a college, one of the things that, that has been proposed is that this becomes a t across all the courses, the TA, and so they're implementing collaborative learning across all sorts of courses. Um, and, you know, this is the uh, pedagogical content knowledge question of, like, is it relevant if I'm teaching, like, 65 TAs across 12 different classes, or does it need to be um, at a much more fine-grained level? Um, the TA feed, as I said, the gra graduate student feedback, uh, you know, and both my grad students had, had 10 years of teaching experience and using collaborative learning in their classrooms, so they had really good feedback for these students, um, or the TAs, and so that was the, that's the piece that, you know, who pays for it, how do we manage to get it to happen? And of course, half of our TAs wouldn't let them in anyway. Um, teaching is not something you necessarily would observe. Um, so that didn't work for everyone, and we're still we're still in, involved in conversations about that. So while that's going on, we we're both saying, okay, well, what's next for this work that we're doing? Where we're creating software for students. Um, this is a big problem, and you know, I am so in support of all these pedagogic reforms, and it's the teaching assistants that are implementing it. And this, so this is where uh, the, everything falls apart, basically if the teaching assistants don't know what they're doing. Courses are one way of doing it. Um, can we use the technology to make this something? Can, can the technology help us at all? Um, we're collecting a whole lot of log file data. Uh, so we started this question of, uh, of the individual, of the tools that we built for the students. Um, can we take them to build tools to support 
um, to uh, support the teaching assistants. Uh, can we use log file analysis, uh, multimodal analysis of the video of students interacting with the log file analysis um, and the magic work that my computer science colleagues do on the log files uh, to identify interaction patterns? And I'm, I'll talk about this a, lot, a little bit. Um, there's places where I am probably going to say, if you have more questions, you need to email Luke Kett, um, because I don't necessarily know all the uh, data analytics side of this. Um, throughout this project, except for the first year when we were in our classrooms, we collected most of our data in uh, the Illinois Digital Ecologies and Learning Lab, uh, which we designed uh, to be a classroom. The data we collected just in the fall, um, we just actually assigned this as our classroom, so students came to our lab every week um, and got really used to it. We have ceiling-mounted cameras that we can move, um, hanging microphones, table microphones, and a one-way mirror that we hang out behind. This was actually um, originally designed in the 60s as a TV studio, um, and so we are like, oh, we end up with a one-way mirror, which um, sort of seems weird, and we, we do have shades that you can pull down on both sides so you don't have to use it. Um, but actually, one of my graduate students used this a lot this last semester uh, to uh, look at what the TAs were doing. Um, you can feed, you can select which audio you want to feed into that room at any one time. So whether it's the microphone the TA is wearing or any of the groups. Um, so we can actually, um, you can do sort of observational uh, studies without having to be in the classroom. Um, and I get used to it pretty easily. We can sync any camera to any audio stream as well, uh, which gives us a lot of freedom in this space. And what, you know, once they get over having to come to the College of Education instead of, there's a mile between education and engineering on campus, uh, this is just a classroom and they get used to it. Um, thankfully there are lecture theaters about halfway between the two, um, so we got over that. Uh, this is the student tool uh, in, I think it's current iteration. Um, this is what they're using in the sync tool. Uh, you can see we end up splitting up the task into different pages, so you can see which page they're on. Um, the scroll location is giving them the sort of uh, meta uh, collaborative view of where everybody is. So each, each student is a color. The student's orange. He's at the top of the page. You can see that purple is halfway down and green is even further down the page. If they're on different pages, their colors actually show up on the uh, page location. Um, and then here's the tools. In some iterations of it, we actually have the tool set as well that they're using in their uh, quizzes and homeworks. So they can drag and drop um, arrows and various other formula kind of stuff that they're used to using. So we, we've tried very hard to sync it with what they're actually doing in their classroom. Um, but you just generate PDFs, PDFs of the task um, that sort of at the beginning of each week we drop into this um, software tool, um, which we designed intentionally to not be overly, overly tied to content. You can change the content up pretty fast. So in our year three data, we had 82 unique participants. This was when we were still doing the multi-touch tables and tablet data. So the first week we just used as you know, getting used to the classroom because this this year this they were just in the lab for three weeks. Um, in week two, 14 groups used the tablets, and in week three, 11 different groups used the tablets. They used each group used tables in the opposite week. Um, so we did video and log file um, analysis on one minute long segments of synced data. Um, so we ended up with 1,128 segments of data. Um, not even nearly enough for my computer science people. Masses of data for the video coding. Um, <clears throat> Although we just coded them in one minute segments um, instead of sort of free coding it. Um, and I'll show you what we did there. We extracted 28 features from the log file data and then the sort of um, looking for patterns between them. <coughs> so this is, this is that first question, like can we do this at all? Uh, so we didn't want to put too much time and energy into our coding of the video. We coded for five different um, classes of, uh, and each, each minute was coded for each of these five things. So. Um, are the students on task or off task? Looking at phones being the primary off task activity that they're doing. Um, talk content, are they not talking? Are they talking about the task or are they talking about off task activities? Uh, is there verbal interaction or no verbal interaction? Is the TA present and interacting with the students or the whole class? Um, and is the tablet being used in some way or not? Um, so these were, this is a fairly simple um, classification of types of activities. Um, as I said, we pulled out 28 log file features, and I'm not going to go through all of them, or we'd be here all day. Um, but we're looking at things like the total quantity of actions in any minute segment, so number of lines that were drawn, uh, number of times the screen was cleared, which is not very often, obviously, in a minute. Um, number of times students undid their last action. Location of the actions, the horizontal and vertical position of the drawings that they're doing, or draw drawings including text. Um, and student co-interactions, so the total number of students drawing on the tablet during any one segment, or uh, the differences between their scroll positions or their page position. This is all, at this point, it's just a single page, so exactly where they are. Um, 
in their uh, in the task. Okay, this is where I get a little bit blurry. Um, but the model development was done by uh, my incredible team, Luke Paquette and Nigel Bosch, um, who um, created models uh, to that we didn't look at the TA. The reason we coded for TA interaction was to exclude that those um, segments of the log file because you're not going to tell a TA that something's going on in a group if a TA is standing there with the group. Um, so we, we did not look at those. We looked at off-task behavior, no talk, task-related talk, other talk, and peer interaction. Um, and because we didn't have a clue, I guess is an impolite way of putting this, uh, we used three different types of um, models. We didn't know what the relationship was going to look like. You know, would it be linear, piecewise? Um, so we used uh, C4.5, which is a decision tree uh, model, ripper, decision rules, and naive phase uh, probability distribution uh, rules. Uh, naive phase is the one that went out. Um, if you have more questions, read the paper. Uh, is my answer to this one. Um, and they tested using Cohen's Kappa and ACU um, to decide which was the best of these. Um, validating the model using a five-fold group level cross-validation, so training it on, dividing the data into five segments, training it on four, and then testing it on the fifth. And this is why they want a whole lot more than a thousand pieces of data. Um, I haven't worked out how to talk about this nicely um, so that it doesn't just look like a table, um, but I'm going to because I don't know what else to do. Um, so the A-prime statistics are the ones I'm really excited about, um, and this is uh, off-task is 0.748. Um, the kappa, kappa is uh, basically inter-rater reliability, um, and so um, 0.423 is not going to get anybody excited in our world. Um, video analysis, but it's getting the computer scientists pretty excited um, that they're getting this high. And then peer interaction is 0.68. Um, so with these large minute-long segments, they feel like they're doing pretty well in being able to say um, with reasonable reliability that they are identifying whether students are off-task or um, whether they're interacting with their peers um, about um, what they're interacting about um, with varying numbers of log files. The more useful things for me, the way I get it, my head around this is thinking about which features are predictive. Um, and some of these have been surprising to us. Um, so the number of students who performed at least one action on their tablet during the segment was really important for understanding um, the amount of collaboration that was happening in the group. Uh, scroll positions of all students in a group is really important to tell if they're all on the same part of the task or not. Um, this one's really interesting, the vertical and horizontal positions of drawing. Um, we write from left to right. Um, if students aren't writing from left to right, they're usually doing something that isn't on task. Um, and so students can sit there. A lot of dueling happens from bottom, bottom to top um, hmm. and on the right side of pages, um, for right-handed students at least. Um, and so um, this actually um, is fairly indicative of off-task behavior, which if you look at a classroom, they're sitting there writing and it looks like they're actually on task. Um, so it's, sort of, it's an interesting piece to sort of say, okay, the, the log file, in, it's... You know, the question of like, what on earth can we tell from what people are writing on a tablet about their collaboration? There's some things that are, that are beginning to be interesting um, for what we're looking at. Um, so we feel like this actually might work, which is really good um, for a four-year project. Uh, the log file features can be used to identify some interaction behaviors with some degree of accuracy. Um, we're exploring smaller segments, so the data we just collected in the fall where we have a ton more data, um, we have about six weeks of the four groups, four classes in the lab, um, where we actually collected, I was really good and not, did not collect video over the 14 weeks of, that they were actually in the lab. Um, we collected about six weeks of their data, um, looking at it in 20-second segments instead of minute-long segments, um, and increased the range of behaviors that were identified. So <coughs> looking for more of the problematic types of behaviors, is a student being left out? Are they excluding themselves? Um, are they off task? Um, is somebody dominating the conversation? Um, and we've also increased the amount and type of data that we're collecting. Um, so we turned on the microphones every time the session started on the on the um, tablets. Um, <coughs> most actual classroom environments do not have the amount of video and audio collection that we can we can do in the lab. Um, I have no idea whether we're going to get anything out of the quality of the tablet microphones, um, but they were there, so we turned them on. Um, the nice thing about working with uh, data analytics people is they're like, hey, give us as much data as you can, and we might throw it out at the end, but if it's easy to turn it on, let's turn it on. Uh, we're also collecting uh, gyroscope data from the tablets, because um, we're seeing, at times, uh, the students pick up the tablet to share it with their group, and uh, that's actually a really nice, obviously a TA could also see that that's going on in the room, um, but it gives us more insight as to what's happening in the groups. Um, so this is where we're going. Uh, we are um, hopeful that with advanced amount of more data and more fine-grained analysis, um, it's Luke's, gonna, Luke's um, pursuing this idea of uh, doing temporal analysis across it because some of these things 
might be interesting 20 seconds, but they might really be interesting if they happen over four or five or 10 20 second segments at a time. Um, so he's doing sort of innovative work in the data analytics field around those questions. Okay, so I feel like I've been talking for a really long time. Um, <laughs> I was going to talk really briefly about the, t the really simple TA dashboards that we did this year. Um, so there are four discussion sections. Uh, they use the tool for 14 weeks. This my uh, computer science developers are like the most incredible people you could. And actually, Ian was doing this, so he is the most incredible guy you could imagine to have software work every single week uh, for about 75 undergraduate students who are learning something. We had one class where we ditched it because the Wi-Fi went down, um, but otherwise it worked. Um, I cannot say enough good things about it. Um, so we did observations during the semester, and we did interviews. Um, throughout the semester, um, depending on when the TAs and CAs were free after their class to talk, so it was totally random um, when uh, my student Lou interviewed them about their use of this. This is what their dashboard looked like, and we're not doing any analytics at this point. Um, so this was just the, like, hey, let's give them something. This is showing, um, this is the timeline, so every, um, I feel like this is done every minute, so this is the end of the class, um, how, how much are people writing at any one time? Group 4 has been identified as what's in purple right here. Um, so maybe 10 minutes in, they were doing a lot of writing. Um, you can see here they didn't do, didn't do much writing for a long time. They're presumably made early on in the task. This is what you expect, right? They're making sense of what they need to do. Then they do a whole lot of writing. Then they go back down to making sense of it. So this is actually a fairly reasonable pattern for the task that they were working on. Um, this is each of the groups that the TAs can select and make larger. And this task has three pages to it. Um, and each color is a student, represents one of the students, which nicely matches their interface of what they see as well. Um, so in group four, all four students are on the same page, and yellow is make, doing most of the, is, has <coughs> written the most at that point in time. Um, this group might be a little bit concerning um, if you're a TA, because two of them are on the first page, one of them's on the second, one of them's on the third. It may be that they're finishing up and they've gone back to look at some stuff, um, and that's where this sort of, this graph would come into play. So this was just like, what can we give them to see what's going on, because we might as well, because they're going to be in the lab anyway. Um, uh, Lou actually did a lot of work with, um, expert teachers and then uh, previous year's TAs to see what sort of information they thought would be useful. As is entirely unsurprising, we found uh, use differed by TAs and course assistants. Some of them used it, some of them didn't. Um, they used it for two primary reasons, uh, to identify stuck groups. Uh, so one, t one uh, TA said, you know, we switched between groups to see who was active on the top line. Um, because, and you know, particularly if you, uh, so in 15, 20 minutes into the class, if they weren't doing anything, they were probably stuck. So if they weren't talking to another TA, I went over and talked to them. Um, and then looking at the lo using the location to see if this meant that someone was not collaborating or being excluded. Um, and again, some people exclude themselves, some people are excluded by uh, the group process. Um, and so, so we were actually seeing them using this for both content and process uh, uh, reasons, um, which you know, was nice to see. And again, there was a few of them who were just like, no, I just put it down and never look at it again. Um, so. Unsur unsurprisingly, uh, the TAs use this, for, use this differently, uh, but does suggest that there's some potential, particularly uh, when they don't even know what they're looking for in the group. Uh, so next steps, uh, as I said, year four data is being analyzed at present in 20 second clips. Um, and so we are hopeful that we can do a better job of actually um, finding these patterns and identifying what's going on. Um, and then over the summer on the full, we'll be developing prompts for the TAs and potentially the students um, really trying to decide who should be getting the prompts for how to collaborate better um, based on the analysis and the log file analysis. And then uh, spring of next year, we were hoping to try this out in the classroom. Uh, so we shall see what happens. Okay, so thank you and my incredible team who make this all happen um, are part of, their name should actually be on the start of this talk. right on the schedule you set for yourself. <laughs> so we have 15 minutes for questions. Which NSF program? Cyber learning. It is cyber learning, okay. Yes, so uh, yeah, we were really happy to get the IP just before they stopped funding it. So I'm curious, you talked a lot about how you were supporting the TAs. Did you tell the how much did you tell the students in the classes about what you were looking for in their collaborations? And uh, particularly when you had the dashboard, because you mentioned possibly giving them prompts, but did they know what kind of collaboration you were looking for while they were doing it? Um, very little. Um, and this has been one of the, this is one of the tensions with working with the, with the College of Engineering. We're like, it would be really great if we could spend 
10 minutes even for the first couple of weeks helping students understand what good collaboration looks like. Uh, for a couple of years we managed to do some of that in the first week um, and then the need to cover content just takes over. And so it's, it's, that's an ongoing issue. Um, and this is one of the things, this is one of the things we're really trying to work out is like, can we embed this so that it doesn't take away from content time? Um, even though that would be a really nice, simple um, way of saying like, hey, hey, you know, what are, you know, what are our group norms? What are the way we want this to happen? Um, we just can't, it blips in and out, but we can't get it consistently. Um, and some TAs do it and some don't. Um, Um, so, given that stereotypically engineers have a difficult time communicating with each other, professionally yes. speaking, and you know, yes. many different levels, how do you think this might look different if this was, say, arts graduate students or literature graduate students or something? Mm -hmm. um, I think I think some of the fundamentals would be easier um, for sure. Um, the work that I was doing before um, I came to Illinois was with the uh, 10, 10 to 12 year olds in the UK. Um, and so our, our actual interaction patterns don't look terribly different. Um, we got actually we got more independent talk from a ten year old. Um, nothing to do with what the previous kid said, uh, which is probably not surprising. Um, I think um, in disciplines where we make talking about the content part of the whole process, it's less stark of a difference. So um, I think a lot of the time in arts disciplines we do act, you know. Being able to describe what's going on is, is part of the field, and so it's not like, okay, I'm just going to teach you all the equations here, and there you're going to get to, like, you know, you get to talk about it in your discussion section. Um, so I think it'll be easier. I think it would be easier. I think this is far more relevant in STEM disciplines than non-STEM disciplines. Um, but I don't think the collaboration dif difficulties go away. Um, yeah, no, it just makes me think that, particularly for the TAs, if they have a difficult time communicating with people to begin with, that reading others right. and, and that whole process might be so. So my work when we were working in the UK the first couple of years, um, and we had a lab classroom set up there, um, and we had a couple of, of our research team who were actually doing the teaching for the first few years of data, and so they 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 have many years of teaching experience. They know all sorts of stuff about collaboration. I have time and time again where they walk in and disrupt the groups, um, where, where they come back and like tell the group something and then two months later come back and tell them something totally different. Um, so I don't think even people who know a lot about collaboration and teaching necessarily know what, mm -hmm. what they're doing in hand, hand supporting groups. Um, and I think the people who I'm talking about would, would agree with me and cringe when they see their own videos at times. Um, so I think that's, you know, how to, this sort of expert teacher view, and I, we, we did interviews with expert teachers early on in this development work. Um, People who've done a lot of implementing collaboration know a lot about it, um, but the majority of us don't know that much. Um, and I think that's the that's the piece where it would be really interesting to um, give pro give prompts. And ideally, this is a tool that becomes obsolete as you get better at it, and you don't need it over the, if you you know you use it week in week out in your class, and then you you should learn to notice this stuff without there being too many prompts. Um, would be the goal. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in your model and. What uh, specific uh, collaborative interaction do you want to predict, and how was it successful? And so the model of, of collaborative interactions that we're looking at. Um, so a lot of what I was building off um, are the ideas of Bridget Barron, who was my advisor, although apparently I'm not still going to be talking about that, um, who talked about, um, it, so she did work, research um, in the smart groups, when smart groups fail paper, where she looked at um, groups who were successful in math activities, groups who were not successful. Um, went back and looked and like, all the groups had the correct ideas, and it was whether the ideas were picked up or developed um, that really mattered uh, for whether the groups were successful in the long run in, this, in these uh, uh, activities that the students were working on. Um, so that's really what I'm looking for in these groups. Um, some of what we've been feeding into the, so um, the representation of where people are on the pages and things like that um, gets at the, um, Oh, why am I blanking on the word? Like metacognitive stuff about mm -hmm. how your group is, is, is interacting. Um, and so we've drawn on that a little bit as well as we've started to develop this tool. Um, so knowing that in a, so in a group, you're working on um, build it, working on the content, you're working on the social aspect, and then you're working on like, are we all team players? Are we all, how do I um, recruit participation and things like that? Um, so we've very much been looking at 
are they social, are they interacting socially in a way that builds on each other's ideas? And then a little bit of this, like, are they aware of each other? Um, group awareness, those kind of pieces. <coughs> Um, I'm not really familiar with the uh, engineering field, so I just wanted to uh, ask you to elaborate on the like task itself. Like, what kind of like task was it? Like, was it more like ill structured? Like, are there you know possible many you know like solutions to have, or were there like lots of research areas to conduct and then lots of like negotiation? Right, and I've, I've been particularly vague about the content. Um, so try, <laughs> try and make, uh, there's no doubt which college of engineering I'm talking about. Um, so about the, the classes that I'm working with right now, particularly when I'm giving dates about them. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been one of the things that we've been really working with faculty on. When I first started, um, some of the tasks were ill-structured, some of them were so ill-structured yeah. that there was nowhere to move with them. Mm -hmm. um, that there was nothing for students to grasp onto, and some of them were so constrained and step by step, but they really didn't encourage collaboration. Um, so we've been working, um, one of the tasks in the year three that I've spent a lot of time looking at is this task um, where um, they're told to design a, a bookshelf mm -hmm. and given three books and a radio um, and say, so, you know, where if you if it's designed like this, will it withstand? And so you're looking at um, moment and force and things like that, right. which, um, so it, it, this is fairly early on mm -hmm. in, the, in the course sequence. Um, and so it's a it's an authentic problem in that it is something you actually might need to do in the world. Yeah. Um, does the bookshelf stand? Can you put can you can you place books all in one place or can you spread them out? Um, there's not a lot of story behind it, and that's something that we uh, were negotiating a lot with the engineering faculty who created a lot of stories, um, but not necessarily a real world problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is it's, yeah. it's sort of this question of like what what makes an authentic problem. Um, and so we've, we've gone after these, um, where the group has to make a decision about how they're going to design the bookshelf, and then how they're going to put the the, mm. the stuff on the bookshelf to te to then test it. And so um, they can they have to negotiate what the group decision right. is mm -hmm. instead of like here's your bookshelf, here's your books, will it work or not? Mm. You got to do all the steps along right. the way. Um, and we provide them with uh, various uh, information sources as well, which again is a change. Um, it's like okay, we're not we're not testing you on whether you know this stuff. We're testing you on whether you can make sense of this stuff. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a change in that. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the first study you present. Mm -hmm. um, like, what is the whole rationale for split student randomly um, every week in different groups? And mm -hmm. um, my question for this, because I know, I believe kind of social interactions as a part of collaborative mm -hmm. learning actually influence the way how students like you mentioned, the forms and the whole identity came out from that there, and how this will influence the way when you link back to the adaptive expertise framework, and how the novice like bring like how the expertise bring the novice in the field, and how this whole randomly um, grouping things affect the way how you interpret the like the results for this framework. Okay, so we didn't collect data on the randomly assigned groups. Um, we stopped that after six weeks, because, um, and that, this is what they tested. So they had been advised to do this by other departments that had been implementing collaborative learning. Um, and I think we've all had experiences where we get stuck in a bad group. Um, and that's what they, that was their primary reason for it. You don't want a student to have a bad group. So we'll just ha have them all have bad groups every week. Uh, which is, so they, without really thinking this through, and without, I guess, um, it's hard sometimes to grasp what a 650 person class is like and how when you're that you know you sign up for your discussion section the first class is mostly freshmen um you don't know anybody yeah. and you just sign up for a discussion section at the time slot that fits with the rest of your classes and so you may not know anybody in these in these sections um which is a very weird, like, I didn't, I never had an experience that was this huge um, in all of my education. <laughs> so I get overwhelmed by it all. So, and I think in other, in other departments, they don't have the same scale issue. Um, so students might not be as unfamiliar with each mm -hmm. other. Um, this weird thing about having to tell them to introduce themselves to each other was also, um, again, I don't think it's necessarily the same across all the other departments that were advising this. Um, and a little bit this sort of sense of not wanting students to be overly comfortable with their learning environment um, is, a, is a, something I don't agree with. I'm not sure we have a whole lot of evidence of this, uh, whether being, you know, I think being comfortable is really important for learning. Um, I think, you know, you take some Amy Edmondson's work on psychological safety um, and that you have to feel safe to be able to express that you don't know something. Um, so all of those features, they, all of those things were just kind of missing from the way they, ta they, they thought, thought about it. it. 
Um, it wasn't, you know, they really did go out and look for advice from other departments. Um, but, you know, and, you know, as I started saying, you know, the context is so incredibly important when you're taking advice. Um, and so, you know, if I'm teaching a statistics class with 50 kids in it, um, who are all graduate students and, you know, all know each other from their lab groups and stuff and pick their discussion sections based on their peers attending it, it might not matter if I change your group up every week. Um, whereas in a 650 person lecture, it really does. Um, so I don't want to be overly critical because I really did search out good insight. Um, it just becomes re really problematic when there's 45 students who don't know each other. Um, <laughs> How does, and so we didn't use that. We were like, we can't use this. We, we're weak in, we can't, we're collecting data. We're like, we can't use this data because there's, the students don't know who they're talking to. Like, this isn't really collaborative learning at all. Because um, they're just sort of sitting at a table not knowing the people they're talking to. Um, and so that's why for the four weeks that we we're like, okay, you guys have to do this so we can have some useful data. And I think you have to do it. And the TAs who, were, who came out, who were teaching the different types of sections, came out and said, oh no, we need to do this all the time. Um, because the students work so much better together when they are in the same groups week in and again. And they go and they sit down and they talk to each other and there's some chit chat and, and it's Charlie Goldman called it social grease and it helps. Um, and so across all these courses they're now, they, they actually fill out these complicated forms online um, at the beginning of the session about um, you know, gender and race mm -hmm. and um, you know we, we were having, we, I, I did end up ditching one of my intact sets of data because the students, three of the students were Chinese and they kept talking in Chinese and my, <laughs> I didn't want to have to transcribe and translate. <laughs> Um, and so the, the, the non-Chinese speaker got left out of the group all the time. Um, and so, so they tried to manage all of those issues as well as, um, yeah, it's a, so, so, and then tr they try and get a diversity of uh, disciplines um, in the groups. So it's, it is this massive other crazy um, thing. So, and then, so by week three, they're in stable groups and they stay in the groups for the entire semester, um, which helps a lot. I want to build on Hazel's question about the problem types. It sounds like, there were a lot of collaboration happening around really structured known answer questions. Yes. That arguably don't lend themselves to collaboration. So at some level there's some risk here that you're fostering like they're really right. as engineers, there are times where you you shouldn't go bug somebody else. You should just knock it out. Right. <laughs> and yeah. so you know, we're seeing a lot of this. We're seeing, you know, <laughs> students complain about being made to collaborate mm -hmm. a lot. You know, a lot right. of students really hate it. And I think that's part of the reason is because they're, it's not an ill-structured problem. Right. It's not framed in a way that, that, that is not a known answer question. So so, and we, so we've talked to the faculty a lot about this, about like, you know what, it's actually okay for some weeks to be individual tasks. Mm -hmm. um, that the content is not, some, we can't generate an ill-structured problem. They don't know enough yet. Yeah. Sometimes when it's multiple weeks of content to get them, um, there's a couple of tasks where you're just like, they don't know enough to be able to engage in the ill-structured content around this. And either we pick a previous task, or a previous content to keep working on, or we say, okay, this week is not going to be collaboration. Or, or you could use a collaborative task to then create the need for whatever it is you're, you're dealing with the content for, whether it's somewhat self-directed or teacher-directed, but getting the students to ask a question. Right, so some, another way to so I have one faculty member who works on these multi-week problems, mm -hmm. um, which are really nice when they can get them to work mm -hmm. and to be like, okay, like they might not walk away with any solution at the end of the first week, um, and the, this comes with like a huge culture change in the in, in the course as a whole. But like, it's okay to come back next week and solve the rest of the mm -hmm. problem. Um, but that's we're a ways off that being something everyone's comfortable with. And you know, again, task development is is time consuming. Um, but yeah, and, and this idea that there's some weeks where you just, not everything is suitable or we haven't managed to develop the tasks that are suitable and it's okay if this is a week where it's a cooperative task or it's an individual task um, and that you, you, know, you use your peers to check your answers um, and this is your learning group and you might, um, you know, and so every now and again we get a faculty member who gets behind and so you're like, well, you're asking them to do a collaborative task on content they haven't covered yet. Um, Although one of the things we have been doing is actually putting putting the the content into their worksheets, mm -hmm. um, so that they're using it as well, which helps. Um, a we did have one disastrous week where nobody had, nobody knew what they were doing, um, and so they were. The, it was actually when I was working with the TAs, and they're like, "Well, they were doing a task, but they haven't got the content up." Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like, "Well, we can give." There's no reason that not to have the content. It's not a test. It's lots and lots of tests. Um, <laughs> no shortage of quizzes and homeworks. Um, and so, so yeah, it, it's real. And it's, so it is this whole idea of thinking about um, 
what are the learning goals as a whole across the course and where are they being met? Um, and sometimes that's in the discussion section and sometimes it's in their quizzes and homeworks and exams and reading and all the rest of it that's happening. Wow. Is that uh, TA's dashboard uh, information available to the student? It's not. We thought about this. Okay. Um, but I think, it's a, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, Luke Piquet, who works with me, has done a lot of work around gaming the system. Um, and so he's sort of hesitant to give too much of this to them, because once you have a goal to work towards, you're going to get there any way you can. Um, I th so I, th I think there's a lot of really interesting questions about um, how to help students make sense of this. Um, Marcella Borja is doing some really interesting work uh, with online classes, where she's actually they're actually celebrating at the end of each discussion about on the various aspects of collaboration that she's trying to have them work on. Um, and I think, for certain, again, this question of like, what what content area does this work for? Yeah. Um, uh, she's working with uh, students in psychology who are really interested in reflecting on their process. Um, I would love, I have actually a, a graduate student who's doing work in physics and he's having the students do a little bit of reflection, um, which, you know, encounter so much resistance, because why do I have to spend five minutes at the end of my class reflecting on my process? Um, but we know that reflection is really important for improving our collaboration, so how do we do, we do it? One, and one of the things we want to do with this dashboard is that the TA, from week to week, pick the different skills that they actually want to focus on and what to get prompted about. Um, so the TA can say, like, okay, today I'm, I'm really focused on joint representation, so uh, then this task requires, you know, so what we see a lot of the time with the introductory classes is students don't create joint representations, don't pre create, they don't draw at all. Um, and so they start solving these problems without actually understanding what they're all thinking about, what they're all talking about, so they don't draw their uh, bookshelf. Um, <laughs> so, like, you just don't draw, it's weird. Um, and so, like, really quickly, you could, if you decided joint representations was something you wanted to focus on this week, um, then you could talk to them about it, or you could prompt it. And so that's, it's a sort of back and forth, giving the TA some control over what aspects of collaboration they want to learn about from week to week. Um, and then do you, do you feed that to the students or not? Um, it's certainly mm -hmm. something that I think we should be thinking about how on earth we do it, I'm not sure, <coughs> without even trying to game it. Do you know anything about the experience of the TAs? Because the reason I ask is we saw, we did a survey here of, they're called AIs here, um, 900 or so of them. And what we saw was their concerns when they're first time TAs or first year TAs is it's all about just getting through the class, mm -hmm. right? And not getting crushed by grading and all that stuff. But as they had more experience under the belt, they seemed to be more interested in, you know, are my students really learning and how do I get better at this? And of course there's some, probably some bias in there, but um, I'm just wondering if you would see differences across those you're engaged with based on sort of, if they've moved past that initial stage and they care more maybe, or they have more experience. Yeah, and it's the, like, I'm doing a TA ship because I couldn't get an RA ship, or I'm doing a TA right. ship because I really care about That's teaching. Right. <laughs> uh, or, and as, so, yeah, the, we, yeah we, we do some surveys. We haven't done a whole lot of them. Uh, the TAs, in the, the work that we just collected, this, you know, they, they self-selected to be in the lab to be videotaped all the time, so they were definitely mm. interested in it. Um, and one of the TAs was actually on our research team um, so that he was giving us, like, week-to-week -week feedback about what was happening. Um, but you're right, it is... You know, one of the things with the TA seminar that we were teaching was that some of them were just like, this is a job. Why do I have to learn about what I'm doing? I just show up, I keep the students from killing each other, and I leave. Um, and so, I, you know, they're, they're, you know, a lot of the time they're graduate, you know, we, um, we've all been there. You're trying to get your dissertation finished. And so it's just one more thing to do. Um, and so, you know, that's a, that is an exaggeration for sure, but some of them were really not. Um, and we did have some issues with them. We're like, no, you really can't be doing homework for other classes when you're in our class because um, this is, you know, they just weren't that interested. Um, and then some of them were really, really interested and really putting it um, in a lot of effort. Um, for them, the other aspect of this was really talking to them about the, um, you know, hey, you're going to go on the job market and you need to write a teaching statement. And it'd be really helpful if you knew something about teaching. Um, I do some uh, work with the uh, women engineering graduate students course on that as well. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that they, they're like, oh, institutions in engineering are actually paying a lot more attention to this. Um, and so um, preparing them to be better faculty members is a part of that. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that, you know, it's nice broader impacts on our sure. NSF grant, but it's also that piece of like um, giving them reason to evaluate beyond just like, hey, this is your job. I'm going to cut things off now because we have pizza. So let's <laughs> thank Emma for answering all the questions.